All right, I'm here with uh, George Ortega, a guy who really doesn't like free will. So if you think you have any, <laughs> you know, he's going to be after you. He's going to exercise that out of you. Um, and I mean mentally exercise it out of you because that's really what you have. You have a brain and it's full of stuff. And so here we are with this edition of the, uh, basically it's a free will, religion, science, or science and religion. Uh, it's basically just about what people, why people do what they do and why they think they do what they do, and how they think about thinking about what they think about, they think they're thinking about what they're doing. And the truth is, it's all just a program. You're really just a machine, and yeah, I don't want to depress you, but that's all you really are. You're just a reflexive device, and uh, you know, you're byproduct, okay? <laughs> There's no product. There's just byproduct, and you're just an accident of the Earth's birth, and you're playing out the role as this human thing, right? You're not you're not flying like a hummingbird, right? You're not uh, moving like a cow, okay? <laughs> you're talking like a human, and you're making noises like a human, and you're doing actions like a human. And if you really want to be the best kind of human you can be, you get this idea that you're doing anything free out of your head, and you understand that the only thing there really is is the evolution of knowledge and understanding. And we can understand the world we live in and we can react to it in a sensible way rather than in some kind of chaotic way where we just keep pretending we don't know enough or pretending we can't figure out that it's no good to steal somebody else's stuff. <laughs> you know, all this stuff we think we can get away with because we're somehow free agents outside of any kind of notion of right and wrong or good and bad or productive and destructive. These concepts exist. Okay, and the only thing that really we're talking about is whether you're going to consign yourself to that fact or not. Are you going to are you going to recognize the truth that there's a good way to do something and a bad way to do something, and the good way is going to be consistent with some sort of logical, mechanical, factual truth. It's going to be like one plus one equals two, and yes, you can freely say I'm not going to pay any attention to that, but. That's just the same thing as saying I'm going to be stupid. Well, anyway, so that's <laughs> there. You go. There's the introduction, George. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Gary. All right. First, I, I just want to say I'm not against free will per se. In other words, like if we had a free will, reality would be completely awesome because like we would all decide to be blissed out every moment of every day. I mean, like think about it. If we had a free will, we would be thinking every moment of each day whatever we wanted to think. You know, we, we wouldn't have any negative reactions and any negative emotions because we wouldn't will ourselves. And actually, that's an excellent way to understand that we don't have a free will. You know, because, like, again, if we had a free will, who, you know, people, like, get depressed, people get upset, people get angry and stuff like that. We wouldn't go to those negative places if we had a free will. Yeah, I suppose. Um, I mean, maybe we would be, maybe we would think freely that we were going to think freely about being a serious person and then we would just be depressed all the time on purpose because we were being free to be depressed or something. So we wanted to be like the depression superhero or something. We're saying, okay, I'm going to be freely do that. So yeah, obviously this free word doesn't go anywhere and this will word is sort of interesting though, you know, because now there's people who talk about power of will. So it's almost like they're, they're making the will free again, <laughs> but they're just using a different word, you know, like you could have a stronger will, like somehow you have two ideas in your head and somehow one idea you make stronger. The idea itself isn't stronger. No, somehow you make it stronger. Yeah, and, and Gary, I mean, we can do that. It's like, you know, we go to the gym, we work out, we can become stronger, run fast or whatever. You know, by exercises, by, by you know, trying harder or something, we could exercise stronger willpower but the, the thing that people don't realize is whether or not we do how well we succeed, you know, when we're trying that or not, none of that is up to us. So, yeah, willpower exists, but willpower is a completely different concept from free will, which is interesting. Is this guy, uh, Roy Baumeister, he's like a pretty eminent psychologist. He has, um, he's, a, he's written a book on willpower, and this guy, or you know, commonly writes articles just trying to um, demonstrate we have free will. So a lot of these academics, they're clues in terms of like what we're even talking about when we say free will. 
Yeah, I still don't. Th I guess I would disagree that I don't think the word willpower means anything because the power is in the idea or the concept. You're either, you know, whether you're going to do something or not do something. So, you know, we could always say what it's versus. You know, there's always the short term versus the long term. Okay, like those kind of comparisons. It's my interest against them, right? So there's always a them versus me. My selfish interest versus the social good. These could be the, the, the th two things in competition. And which one wins isn't going to have anything to do with any power thing. It's just going to have to do with which idea, all right, I'm more devoted to, which idea I've clung to or I've grasped onto, which one really holds my ego. You know, if I can, if I can, if I can steal candy from the baby and get away with it, would I do it? Or would I have a sense of I couldn't live with myself if I did? I couldn't look at myself for the face in the mirror thing, right? That's the power. The power is just recognizing that you either have character or you don't have character. But it's there's no you can't make it happen. You can't power it up because there's no you to do that anyway. You're just a spectator. Right now, I'm just watching myself say this stuff, right? I didn't. I'm not, I'm not reading it out of Gary book somewhere, right? It's just flying out of my mouth, right? My brain cooked it up. I'm saying it. I'm as surprised as you that I just formed that sentence. I hear you. And so, like, so, yeah, so in a, in a sense, like, you know, there is no quote-unquote willpower that's up to us because nothing is up to us. Other, and, and, like, this is important. I mean, one of the reasons a lot of people don't want to accept this, don't want to understand this, is because of what we were just talking about. They're afraid that, like, if we abandon this belief in free will, we're going to think, we're going to go around thinking, well, absolutely nothing is up to us. That means, like, you can't hold us accountable for anything or we're going to do whatever we want. But so, like, you know, whenever, whenever we're trying to, like, explain this, why we don't have free will and how we can use this, like, to improve our lives, improve the world, we always have to say, fine, we don't have free will, nothing's up to us, but our actions have consequences, positive, negative, whatever. So that doesn't mean that we're going to do whatever we want because, like, other people are going to hold us, quote, unquote, accountable, and we're going to hold other people accountable. So, you know, some things are not going to change all that much when our world shifts from this free will paradigm to understanding that absolutely nothing is up to us. Yeah, I mean, there, there, it always comes up, this argument about, not, you know, not being responsible. But not being responsible doesn't change the fact that you either did a good job or a bad job. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it just doesn't change. It just doesn't make a difference. If I, if I burn the house down accidentally or I burn the house down on purpose, the house is burned down. I still sort of suck, and that's just the way it is, right? So you can still call something what it is. You don't need to blame it necessarily beyond just saying this thing is either dangerous or this thing's not dangerous. And so there's ideas in your head that are dangerous. If you're a, you know, if you're a selfish person who's, you know, texting on their phone while they're driving and doing all this other stuff because you have this weak will and can't seem to do the responsible thing because you're too lazy. You have these lazy habits and these lazy ideas. Well, you only have them because Nobody you care about has been ruined by somebody doing that. But as soon as I kill your mother, texting, maybe you'll get it then. Yeah, well, here's the thing. A lot of people are afraid that, again, um, you know, if we don't have a free will, if we think we don't have a free will, we're going to do whatever we want. So it, it's going to make some difference. But what happens is, like, when people do something wrong under the free will illusion perspective, we may hate them. We want revenge. We want vengeance. We want them to suffer because of what they've done, because they did it of their free will. But to the extent we shift to understanding that, like, whatever they did, it really wasn't up to them. They were like puppets. They were literally like puppets that, you know, they're doing something that, that they had absolutely no say in. Then, yeah, we might have to, for example, prosecute them or put them in, in jail or something. But we're going to be, like, treating them, I think, with more respect, with more compassion. And from our perspective, you know, like, to, to hate people sometimes, to hate and really, like, you know, seek that kind of vengeance, sometimes we enjoy that. But I, I think that's a kind of like a sick kind of pleasure. I think, you know, our best selves don't like to go to a place where we're, real, we're hating other people and groups of people. So to the extent we shift this, our perspective, we're going to be treating people much more compassionately, with more respect, and we're going to be feeling better about ourselves and others. You know, again, we're, gonna, we're not going to let whatever happens, happens, because we can't. We need to, like, uphold our rules and laws, but it will be, we'll, go, we'll go about it much more intelligently. 
Yeah, I, I again, you know, I, I sort of I'm sympathetic to the general argument that you know this there's a better perspective, but I guess I guess part of me says you know if you can't add two plus two, I mean if you can't figure out not to whack somebody in the head with a brick and steal twenty dollars, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you're so broken, you know, you're such a train wreck that I don't I don't have to have any empathy for you as an animal or anything else. You know what I'm saying? You're just so broken. That you know, this the quicker we can put a bullet in your head, the happier I'm going to be. So I, I mean, it's not a vengeance thing per se, but it's just, hey, I'm going to acknowledge when something ain't worth it. And there's certain people, certain activities that you basically declared yourself worthless because you couldn't add two plus two. I mean, you're just so bad at being alive that there's just no reason for anybody uh, to worry about uh, your rehabilitation or you know any of that stuff. Right. Well, here in our world today, what happens is like so. We attribute free will to people, and we have people in our world that act like that, you know. And so, like, we don't think. We say, well, you know, they did that of their free will. They're just evil people. They're horrible monsters. Whatever. They deserve to suffer. And we never like look beyond that to wait a minute. Why did they do what they did? What happened during their childhood? What happened growing up and stuff? Like, if we don't look for the reasons why people do, why we do what we do, when, when we're not doing what we should be doing and stuff, you can guarantee we're not going to understand as a society why people act the way we do. And then, like, if we don't understand that, then we're going to, like, be doomed to kind of, like, have people doing this kind of stuff, like, indefinitely. Because basically, like, when you go from the free will perspective to the causal will perspective, you are much more in touch with the reasons that, that there are reasons why people become the way that they become, so that, you know, like for future generations, for raising our kids, then we can, like, develop better programs, better environments, better better schools, better whatever, to, to help them causally, you know, become adults that are going to be kind of like the, the kind of people that we're not going to hate and we're not going to vilify. Yeah, well, of course, sort of is a key thing. I don't think it's all that complicated, but, yeah, we're not maturated with any kind of notion about understanding the mechanism of our psychology, because usually the people who will have children are usually preoccupied by being really caught up in the game. You know, they're they're playing, they keep up with the Joneses game, and that's why they had kids in the first place, is because they're sort of playing the game, right? And so they don't inform you that, you know, you're just a silly psychology, and you're going to have these stupid desires that are going to rise up in you. You know, every day you're going to want to breathe some air, and every day you're going to want to eat some food, and then every once in a while you're going to do that, I'm you know, horny thing, and I want some, you know, I want some love, and, uh, you know, this is what you're going to do with your life. You're going to spend your life trying to catch these little butterflies, you know, that'll make you happy. Ah, I got the, I got the blue butterfly. Ooh, I, you know, I got, I'm going to get a red butterfly tomorrow, and, you know, you're just catching your little butterflies to say, oh, look at me, I'm happy, and it's, that's, you're just a program machine. You're just a butterfly chaser, and it really doesn't even matter what you're chasing, whether you're chasing winning the, uh, the gold medal in baseball or winning the gold medal in, you know, whatever, skipping really fast. It just doesn't matter. You're just chasing some sort of, hey, I'm important. I, I'm necessary. I'm vital. I'm interesting. I'm something, you know. Uh, and that's all you do. It's just an ego game just to feed your little needs. And it's all pro. I mean, none of that stuff's rational, right? Not one of our desires has anything to do with rationality. They all have to do with some sort of visceral ego, me important kind of stuff, and it doesn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, curing cancer or doing doing something, doing something rational for the world. And all right. you know, go ahead. I hear you. So, like, because like over half of academic philosophers can't wrap their heads around the fact that we don't have a free will. They they concoct this this nonsensical compatibilism concept that they say, yes, we believe that everything has a cause, but we have a free will. That makes absolutely no sense at all. So basically what you're saying is these people, because we're trying to figure out how can people not get that they don't have a free will. So what you're saying is like their need to feel in control, their need to feed their ego is so immense that it completely hijacks their reasoning and they can't think because they need to take credit for, for these things they do. That's what you're saying, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, the only original thinking we do is sort of related to rationalizations, you know, coming up with excuses to take the candy from the baby. You know, we know 
that it's uh, probably a lie and we're playing with the truth, but we'll do it anyway because we want our team to win. We want a justification for my ideals or my subjective taste. You know, I want them to paint the, the train station the colors I like. You know, and so I'll come up with some sort of nonsense, you know, to try to say, oh, yeah, blue is better than green. You know, Einstein says so. You know, and, and this is all part of our, you know, it's all our visceral, personal, subjective crud, and none of that crud has any integrity. I mean, none of it, we didn't get any of it by thinking hard and saying, I'm going to desire these really good things to desire. I'm going to establish these really sensible goals. And instead, we just let these natural tendencies to own us, and then the culture basically says, "Go that away. That away is really cool." And so we go wherever the culture points us, without ever really understanding what our brain's doing to us and how it is pulling the you know the strings are being pulled by four billion years of evolution. Okay, you know I can understand how the average person on the average street may not be thinking all that through, may not, you know, come to that realization. But you've got academics and philosophy, especially in psychology. You know, you have to understand the whole psych psychology field pretty much ignores this issue because, like, you know, they don't come out and tell the world, listen, you have absolutely no free will. So, like, I mean, this is a problem, in other words. Like, you know, to be a, a, a scientist, to, to have a PhD, you would think that you would have skills and critical analysis, intellectual integrity. So the problem that we have is that even though like this, this realization we don't have a free will is as simple and as straightforward as, as acknowledging, well, if everything has a cause, we don't have a free will. If you want to challenge that and say some things don't have causes, that's not going to give you a free will either. So like the, the fact that these people don't get this, this, you know, really means that, that these people in academia, again, the, the highest, you know, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Yale, they are very, very intellectually immature. They're, they're not objectively, you know, uh, looking at the situation because they're, they're so ego-driven. It's, it's, it's really unfortunate. This is the state of higher education, not just in the United States, but across the world. Yeah, well, unfortunately, fields like psychology or even philosophy are necessarily bent, you know, by this whole psychology thing. So, in a sense, they're going for some, you know, they're they're not really analyzing how the thing works. They're really just comparing it to this is what's called well-adjusted. Okay, well-adjusted means you accept this and accept that and accept this and accept that because that's what our culture says. Okay, you drink Coca-Cola, you like capitalism because, well, it's no right, so it's a little bit nasty, but it's okay, you know, because you're an American and blah, blah, blah. And that's, you know, so all they're trying to do is make well-adjusted people, you know, people who will, you know, be one of the Borg, <laughs> you know, and just put on your face and just pretend to be a human being playing the game, you know, and that's all. We're, we're just, we're just facade, right? I mean, our, you know, we never reveal <laughs> this little snake monster that lives inside of us, right? I mean, the little conniving and scheming animal that we really are inside. No, no, you know, if we really, you know, that would be the, the game would be over is the minute we invent some device where we could see somebody's thoughts, <laughs> you know, then we're all in trouble, right? Because then the lie is, then, then the facade is down, then the lies are over with, and we we can say, look, this is what we really are, so quit playing this game like you're you know, doing something magnificent and beautiful because you're just a scheming little monkey. Yeah, that you know, that's an intriguing prospect. I've always thought like they've got voice technology that, to some degree, is able to detect deception. You know, by a person's tone, tone of voice. They have eye movement technology can, that can uh, detect deceit. So I, I can imagine some kid developing this app for, for a smartphone that you hook it up, you point it at somebody, the camera and, and, the, and the audio, and you can tell pretty reliably, reliably whether that person's telling the truth. I'm telling you, that would change the world. You just like put it onto the television set, you know, and see these politicians all of a sudden not want to go on TV and all. But all right, Gary, <laughs> What, what I want to get to, though, so, yeah, so, like, we've got this, like, we've got, like, these academians are completely intellectually immature. They're not scientists. They're just, like, you know, they're, they're ego-driven. We do a lot of stuff that's wrong. Now, here's the thing. None of this stuff is up to us. So what do you make of the, the fact that it's, like, it's the universe 
that's making us be so less perfect than we would be. Because, like, again, if you had a free will, if I had a free will, I think we'd be the most, like, completely mature, intelligent, well-adjusted people, you know, that we could be, right? But, but, but nature, whatever you want to call it, doesn't allow us to do all that. What, what do you make of that? Yeah, well, it's, it's sort of the metaphor of the Star Trek metaphor, right? The Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock. You could almost say the monkey versus Mr. Spock. So that's the range of what we can be as a human being, right? A monkey or Mr. Spock at the, at the pinnacle, you know, where you've eviscerated the stupid, simplistic, crude desires, and all of your desires are somehow higher desires. You know, you're oriented towards some, you know, big game, big picture, kind of view and you're going to play the biggest game you can play. You're not playing the little game, kick kick the ball kind of stuff. You're playing the big game where you're, you know, building the architecture for the future kind of thing and you're you're really into that kind of knowledge that, you know, your life is this big, you know, and the future is, you know, times the speed of light square gigantic and uh, you know that's where the priority has to be and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that big idea kind of thinking versus this little idea stuff. And and that's the only you know it's the downside is that we're you know we're still monkeys we can see it in in human uh, uh, culture, but the bright side is yeah over the last ten thousand years obviously the the evolution of memes the evolution of ideas and devotions has improved okay <laughs> we're not uh, doing the overt slavery anymore I mean it's still there but it's not at least overt. And uh, you know, women and all that kind of stuff. So we have made some improvements. You know, the, we passed laws against some animal cruelty. So yeah, we've made some progress. And but that's the kind of progress that would be exponentially faster. Okay, if people would just let go of these notions that the universe is run by something other than cause and effect, and that even their gods, you know, if they thought about it for a minute, what do they think their god is thinking? What, you think their God just sits around and waits for thoughts? Okay, I'm just sitting here as God, and I'm just going to wait for an idea to pop into my head from nowhere. Okay, it's going to come from nowhere. Here it comes. Yeah, human. Okay, yeah, I'll make some humans. Yeah, cool. Oh, you know, I mean, it's just a silly idea. Free will, oh, yeah, God. Yeah. I mean, come on. All right, so, I mean, so, Gary, you're talking about, like, big ideas and all there's, there's a psychologist, Susan Blackmore, 2005. She's writing a book. She's interviewing people for a book, Conversations on Consciousness. She interviews this eminent American philosopher, John Searle, in the Sanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. He's ranked number 13 in terms of how many times he's been cited by other philosophers. Now, Blackmore asks him, you know, if our world came to understand that free will is an illusion, what would that mean? His answer is that would, quote, be a bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein or Copernicus or Galileo or Newton or Darwin. It would alter our whole conception of our relation with the universe, end quote. Now, my question, Gary, is why do you think he said that? What, what, why, why would this revolution in human thinking be greater than any of the other revolutions that came, took place in the past? Well, because it really does create this separation from, between us and the insect. You know, it, it breaks the we have to be a bug syndrome. You know, and, and it makes us really understand that all there is is this thing called behavior, and it only fits into two categories, okay? Good and bad are more precisely the, you know, better and best are, you know, I mean, good and better, let's say. Good and better behavior, you could even argue. But the idea is, is that, yes, you're, you're trying, you know, perfection is the reasonable goal. Uh, failing to reach it is too bad, but it's still the right thing to head for, right? I mean, no point in not trying to do anything other than perfect every moment of your existence. Try to get the most out of it. These are logical principles, and once you get rid of this notion that you're waiting for your will to do something, well, you don't need to wait. You can just let logic tell you what to do. And logic is going to have an answer for every circumstance. Logic is going to give you a good answer. And all you need to do is trust that. It's interesting because, you know, logic or reason is actually one of the reasons we don't have a free will. In other words, if we're, con we're conditioned, we're hardwired to always do what we think is going to be the most reasonable. You know, we've got two options. What makes more sense? What's more intelligent? What's more logical? 
Now, all right, we got to acknowledge that sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes we don't do what's most logical, but that's only because our emotions are kick kicking in, you know, making us do what's irrational, making us do what our unconscious wants us to do, but there's no free will there either. So, you know, this, this lot, we have a logic imperative, reason imperative. We have a hedonic imperative. We're always trying to do what we think is going to bring about more pleasure, more, more happiness for ourselves, for other normal. So there's no free will there. I mean, um, again, we, we have to kind of like, in, in getting this message to the world, all right, you, you've identified one reason, that, that basically we're ego-driven. We, we like to think that stuff is up to us, you know, because to make us feel good, to make our egos feel good. But what other messages do you believe we have to like, you know, put out to the world to help, especially the academics, finally get this to to, to help them get the no of it. You know, put your ego aside. I mean, like, you know, free will is completely impossible. What do they have to hear to be able to change? Well, I guess it's just I still go back to the thing of if you were building a robot, <clears throat> would you give it? you know, the emotions that we have when you give it the interest, you know what I'm saying? No, you'd build a robot for a task. You wouldn't want it, you know, saying, no, I want some cupcakes, and no, I don't want to work right now, I want to go play ball, and no, I want, you know, you wouldn't give it a self-interest because it wouldn't get any work done. It'd be completely corrosive to the productivity of this machine you were making to give it, you know, uh, I'm lonely, I'm, you know, I want to, you know, have some romance, and I want, you know, wh why would you want it distracted by all this nonsense? And so I guess I'm just saying that that's, that just compare yourself to that and just say this is what, understanding that your will is just a mechanical device gives you the freedom to say, oh yeah, I'm mostly bad programs. And the ones that really have value inside of me are these ones that can do this rational thing where I can see the advantage where, you know, if I do this the right way, you know, instead of just one people having, you know, food for a week, a hundred people could have food for a week. You know, it's all this engineering thing. So I, now I can see that, you know, yeah, I can, I can engineer a better program, and if I let my monkey do it, the monkey's just going to make a mess out of it. I have to let the Mr. Spock kind of run the show. So when anything serious is happening, yeah, Mr. Spock should be who I try to be. And when it's not serious, well, yeah, then I can be a rhesus monkey. Okay, I think, yeah, I think one, one, one reason they don't get it, they, want, they don't want to get it, is like, you know, they, and, 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 you know, what you just said, though, like, you know, like, why would nature create, um, you know, freely willed beings that are so, you know, screwed up in so many ways as human beings are? You know, that kind of, that makes a lot of sense. But that brings in the issue of, like, well, is nature, is this process that created evolution, that, that created, you know, the planets and the solar system and all, is it intelligent or not? Is, is it conscious? And so I think a lot of scientists don't want to go there, you know, because it's kind of like, you know, it, it goes into this religion thing and all, but but in general, all right, we got about three minutes left or so, three, four minutes. So in general, um, I think a lot of people refuse to accept this because they're afraid, again, that if people, if the world understands that nobody has a free will, everybody's going to say to themselves, um, well, we can do whatever we want. Nobody's like, you know, you can't blame us. You know, you can't blame me because I'm not fundamentally responsible. And they're afraid that, that um, that society, civilization will collapse. You know, again, what what would you say to them to kind of like calm those fears? Yeah, yeah, I'd say exactly the opposite is true because now now you just judge performance, right? You're not judging motives, you're not judging intent, you're not judging any of that nonsense. You're just judging outcomes. So we just sit there and establish that the principle. Look, we understand we're all just little puppets on strings, and the idea is we don't want one puppet hurting the other puppets and all that kind of stuff. So we can measure your performance, right? And if you're cost too much, if you're too expensive, we can measure that, all right? And so the pressure is higher, not lower. You know, your, your standard of accomplishment is going to be higher. I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to actually do some calculating, and you're going to have to actually do something worthwhile, or you're going to be declared uh, useless or redundant or pointless, uh, not worth investing in, yeah. So be afraid. Be afraid of the higher standards that are created by no free will. That's excellent. So in other words, to the extent we understand we don't have a free will, we're going to be looking for the reasons why people aren't measuring up, aren't doing what they should be doing. Okay, Gary, we've got about a minute left, 45 seconds. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, I think we, we, I think we nailed it once again. <laughs> we'll just keep hammering more and more nails in the free will coffin and uh, get people to realize that will, even if you call it will, it's still nothing, it's still just programs running, 
All right, and you have good programs and you have bad programs. Try to have good pro programs. There, try okay. to do that. <laughs> Excellent. We, we've got like you know we've got about ten co-hosts on this so far. We want to create at least a podcast every day. We want this to go big. We want this to go viral. We want to get more and more people doing this. All right. Good seeing you, George. All right, Gary. Thanks. Excellent. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.